Looks like it's fun to carry around a lot. It's a fun story, I can tell you later. Very effective. Yeah. Bringing certain gamification aspects out of games into real life uh, has proven very good for most things. Right. Good. I'm curious if someone could make a very, because you know that there are a lot of mobile games out there that are not fun, but people play. Right. I wonder if you could do a similar thing. Right. I don't think it's necessarily a good idea <laughs> or a good thing. Hi everybody, I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Northeastern, and uh, my advisor is uh, Maggie safer and uh, we uh, are a games lab. Um, we do games research, and uh, previously before this, I worked as a gameplay programmer. Um, so I have kind of a partially industry-inspired and partially academic-inspired approach. And today I'm going to talk about how I'm starting to try to combine those two things uh, by talking about this experiment I'm doing. Uh, for a tool for evolving behavior traits in Unreal Engine. So let's get started. Uh, but before we talk about what I'm doing, I want to make sure that I thank everybody who's helped with this project so far. Um, so my advisor uh, and many of my fellow students have contributed to this project. Um, and also thanks to Dr. Stacy Marcella, uh, who gave some great advice at the beginning of the project. And thanks to everyone else who has contributed to this work. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover why we're trying this experiment of applying evolution to behavior trees. And we'll give a brief overview of what behavior trees are in general so that everybody's on the same page. We'll talk about how genetic programming evolves tree-like structures and how we're using that in this project. We'll talk about our experimental tool that combines behavior trees and genetic programming in Unreal Engine 4. And then we'll talk about several ideas we're going to explore, hopefully, for future improvement of this process. So first, let's talk about what behavior trees are and why we might want to evolve them. Behavior trees trace back to at least Damian Isla's work on the Halo 2 AI system in 2005, though they have been expanded on significantly since then. They've become a common technique for agent AI in the games industry. And that's because they allow designers to clearly and explicitly specify the behavior that they want in very specific situations. They allow designers to explicitly specify that by building a hierarchy and a structure for decision making and behavior that's very human readable and is a very visual format that is easily understandable for people who are not programmers. However, behavior trees are only as flexible and robust as the situations and conditions that their designer thinks to include. So often, an agent may not respond well to unexpected situations that are not covered by the behavior tree's logic. And automatically discovering options for behavior in unforeseen situations and suggesting them to a designer might maybe help designers make more robust, flexible behavior trees. Alternatively, sometimes a designer just might want inspiration for creative behavior that they've never thought of before. And 
evolutionary algorithms, which we'll talk about in much more detail later, are a way to explore a possibility space in a very kind of mix between guided and random manner. Um, so it's kind of semi-guided and semi-random, and it could provide new ideas that could inspire a designer's creativity. So our main question in this experiment is, by evolving behavior trees, by starting from a hand-designed tree, and then helping with the guidance of the designer to evolve them, can we spark creativity, add robustness, and preserve design intent and interpretability? So before we get to the results of this experiment, let's talk about the basic pieces involved. How do behavior trees work? Well, tasks are the leaves of the tree. Uh, so there are three types of nodes in a behavior tree. There are tasks, there are composite nodes, and there are decorators. Now, this is just one kind of example of a behavior tree system. Um, there are some variations at various companies. There are variations in various theories of behavior trees. So this particular like description may be slightly different for some systems that you end up using. But here's one basic idea of a behavior tree. So tasks are the leaves of the tree. They're usually the actions that you want to perform. They might also be conditions or checks that need to be performed before those actions can take place. Composite nodes are the internal nodes in the tree, and they control when and how the tasks run. So for instance, a sequence node will just run all of the tasks that are its children, and if one of them fails, then it'll stop, it'll say, wait, I can't continue this sequence, something failed, and it'll go back up to the next part of the tree. The opposite of that is a selector, where it only runs the first task that succeeds as its child, and then if one thing succeeds, it does not run the rest of its children. So it's more like an if statement. So basically, like, the first node that its child is is the first branch of the if statement, the second node is the next else if, and so forth. There are some other control nodes, composite nodes, um, like parallels and loops and things like that. Um, but for more detail on this, you can look up various other resources about behavior trees. Decorators uh, are in some behavior tree systems, not in others, but they have a single child mainly, and they modify the behavior of that child. So this can be really useful for things like inverting the result of a child. So instead of having to write a, like, have I seen the enemy or have I not seen the enemy condition, you can write a, have I seen the enemy condition, and then invert it for the other case. So this is how decorators are useful. They can modify things below them. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the basics of genetic algorithms, and specifically a particular type called genetic programming. Genetic algorithms have been around since at least the 1970s, if not before, and they're a way to perform a semi-random, semi-guided search through a large possibility space. They take their inspiration from the real evolution that occurs in nature. And we start with some initial population. Uh, they're not exactly like real evolution, but they take their inspiration from that. We start with some initial population where each individual is defined by some set of genes, which we're gonna call a chromosome in this talk. Uh, though in nature, an individual's genetic code might have many chromosomes. Uh, let's just assume that all of the genes are on a single chromosome for this algorithm. So we measure the fitness of the individuals in the population, and we find which ones are best at achieving some specific metric of success that we care about, some objective or goal that we have. Next, we select parents with the likelihood of selecting a particular parent as, uh, related to its fitness, proportional to its fitness. So we tend to focus on the organisms that are most successful. Then we create one or two children from those parents, possibly swapping some genes between them, and maybe even mutating some of them completely randomly. We repeat this until we get a full new generation, and now we have uh, things that might be better than our original solution, or they might be worse. But because we tend to pick more successful individuals over time and randomly provide them with new mutations that might help them or might hurt them, we tend to improve the overall results over many generations. Now, 
you may notice that I'm saying improve, and that means that we need a specific goal or fitness function that represents success. This can be really difficult, and we'll return to that problem later in the talk. Genetic programming is a particular type of genetic algorithm, and it's designed to work on computer programs. So in most other genetic algorithms, the chromosome is a linear list of genes. But in genetic programming, it's a tree. Now in genetic programming, that means that the uh, crossover and mutation needs to be a little bit different. Uh, so there may not be an exact part of the tree in one of the two parents that corresponds exactly to the shape and location and size of a subtree in the other parent. So how do you deal with this? Well, the most basic form of genetic programming actually just picks a random subtree from both and swaps them for the crossover. So it doesn't really care whether those subtrees do the same thing or whether they're the same size. Um, it just picks a random one and swaps it. And it turns out that actually works pretty well. Uh, there are some other options you can use in other advanced genetic programming techniques, but the basic way just works, mostly. Uh, another common operation in genetic programming is point mutation, which is just like the single gene mutation that you would do in any other genetic algorithm. You just pick one node and you randomly change it or remove it or add. Um, and that's another way that genetic programming tends to mutate its trees. Now, many types of programs can be represented as what's called a parse tree, which is basically just a tree of variables and operators, kind of like the one we see there. And the usual case of genetic programming is to operate on these parse trees. But it turns out that behavior trees are a lot like parse trees. They're trees of variables or tasks and operators or composites. And you can actually basically just take genetic programming and apply it directly to behavior trees. Now, we're not the first to think of evolving behavior trees. Uh, Lim, Baumgarten, and Colton evolved behavior trees for individual decisions that the AI needed to make in a game called DEF COM, which is a strategy game. And their process isolated each particular little strategic decision that the AI would need to make and evolved a small tree for that particular decision. So they evolved some of the structure and some of the variables to specifically choose particular numbers and parameters and tried to achieve the best performance on that one little decision. Then they combined the best decisions uh, trees by hand into a full AI. And another application of evolution to behavior trees was by uh, Perez and others. Um, and they used evolution to build a behavior tree to control Mario. So rather than evolving the trees directly, they evolved the choices that would be made in a specific grammar. And they did that because they wanted to limit the structure of the behavior tree to make sure it didn't kind of grow out of control or have like le lots of extra redundant operators. Um, so they evolved what's called an and or tree, where basically they would have one uh, level of sequence nodes, the next level would be all selectors, the next level would be all sequence nodes, and so forth. And that way they controlled the structure to something that was more kind of uniform. And in the end, they uh, did pretty well. They put their Mario controller into a competition, and it did quite well. Um, so it seems like this might be a good idea. But both of these systems were very specific to the games and to the problems they were trying to solve. And they both operated on pretty small, constrained games and pretty small, constrained behavior trees. So we're curious, can you scale this up and generalize it to more types of games, can we put this in front of designers and have them play with it uh, and see if they can make it work for their particular game rather than just having one situation and one solution for one particular game? So this brings us to our tool for evolving behavior trees in Unreal Engine 4. So Unreal Engine 4 already has behavior trees as a standard thing in its engine. So that's really nice. And we found a open source uh, survival game uh, by Tom Rubin, uh, which is designed to kind of teach you uh, basic survival game programming in Unreal Engine. And it has some simple zombies that can patrol and try to chase you if you make noise, and they'll damage you if they catch you. 
And so we figured this would be a nice, very simple test case for our very first experiments with evolving behavior trees. So we built on top of that. What we did was we intentionally broke the chasing and patrolling functionality of the behavior trees, but we still provided a like partial behavior tree for our evolution to start from, kind of like if we were a real designer creating part of a tree or part of a behavior and then trying to help our, let our algorithm figure out how to finish it or help improve it. So we let the zombies re-evolve their chasing and patrolling behaviors. Uh, so the process for this is basically this. We start by translating the behavior tree into a chromosome, which is still a tree, and we'll talk about how that happens in a minute. We then build the initial population. We translate each chromosome-based tree back into a real behavior tree in Unreal Engine so that it can be run. We then simulate all of the agents to find their fitness. Then we select parents based on their fitness. We mutate, and then we create the next generation. And then we repeat that by translating back into real behavior trees, running the simulation again, and so forth. Now, the chromosome we want to work with is a simplified representation of behavior trees, so that we don't have to copy around the full Unreal Engine behavior tree objects. And we replace each node with an ID that points to the actual node in a library of them. And we translate back into the real Unreal behavior tree nodes during the simulation. So to set up this evolution process, we give the tool our hand-designed behavior tree, we give it a library of extra nodes that it could swap in during mutation, and we provide this library of nodes rather than just generating new nodes from scratch for two reasons. First, the Unreal Engine behavior tree nodes are not built to be created in code, they're built to be created in a visual scripting tool. And we would have to re-implement a bunch of their basic nodes in order to be able to generate different values into them because um, they're not designed to be modified in code. And so we didn't really have time to do all of that yet. But second, it might actually be useful for designers to be able to control what nodes are available to this evolutionary process. Uh, so if they have some idea of what kinds of things they might want their agent to do, what some good kind of parameters or numbers would be, it might be helpful to actually reduce the search space by making sure that they only have, that the evolution can only operate on those things that they think might be good. Uh, so using this library of nodes can actually help us test that idea as well. We also need to set up some parameters for the evolutionary process. We need to set up mutation types and probabilities of choosing each mutation operator. We need to set up a number of generations to run on, uh, the size of each generation, how many agents are there. We need to set up parent selection algorithms and parameters, and we need to provide a fitness function. So we have quite a bit of set up an interface that we need to do right now. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So to set up the initial population, we don't want to just copy the human design tree directly, because then there would be no variety in the population, and it would take a really long time for mutation to actually create interesting behavior. So instead, we randomly create a whole bunch of generations, and we can configure how many, with a very high mutation rate from that initial tree. And we don't simulate them, we don't check the fitness, we just randomly mutate a bunch of times. And this provides a variety of genetic material for the algorithm to start with, but it's all still based on that original tree that the designer created. We select parents using tournament selection, which is a nice simple method of biasing our selection towards higher fitness individuals, but still giving everyone a chance. So first we choose some constant number, such as three individuals, at random. Then we take the highest fitness individual from that little subset, as our parent. And we repeat this a whole bunch of times uh, to create the whole population. So that means that if we happen to select only low fitness individuals for some particular tournament of three, then one of those low fitness individuals will be a parent. But over many tournaments, it's likely that many of these little tournaments have high fitness individuals in them. And if the high fitness individual is in there, it always wins. So the larger the tournament size, the more likely it is that high fitness individuals will be present in the tournament. So we can actually set that tournament size to get a good trade-off between variety of the next generation versus the fitness, that, the average fitness that we choose for the next generation's parents. 
As previously described, we used the standard basic crossover operator from genetic programming to just randomly swap any subtree with any other subtree. Um, we could explore other options in the future, but for now this seems to work. And as described, we randomly mutate individuals using point mutation, where we replace a random node in the tree with one from the library. And we need to use a node of the correct type, so it needs to be like a task node if we're replacing a task node, etc. Now for our simple zombie survival game, the fitness function we decided on incorporates these factors. And we tuned this fitness function to encourage zombies to attack the player, but also to move around the level and to avoid damage if possible. We also added this penalty for overly verbose chromosomes to encourage the behavior tree to remain simple and readable if possible, to achieve the best behavior it can with the fewest nodes it can. So what happens? Well, we see a noticeable improvement in our zombies over just a few generations, usually. Obviously, because genetic algorithms are a bit random, we don't get exactly the same results every time we run the simulation. Uh, so you may see better or worse results in certain runs. But usually what happens is that only one or two zombies can move or chase, but after a playable number of generations, many more of the zombies can chase the player. Some can patrol around and chase the player. Uh, in fact, let's just see this in action. I have a little video for you. Just a moment. So here's one set of clips from an example run uh, in order. So we start where you can see that very few of the zombies can move at all. Uh, the one that can, or the one or two that can, are just kind of moving around randomly. And they don't really seem to follow the player. They just kind of ignore you. Uh, so in this particular run, they sort of learned to patrol around a little bit, but they didn't know how to chase you. But pretty soon, one of the zombies will figure out Oh, I can, I can get a better reward by attacking the player. And then they start to learn to chase you. And then more and more zombies start to figure this out and then learn to chase you down. And pretty soon you've got basically uh, a whole horde of zombies coming after you. And it becomes very difficult to actually survive. Uh, so then you're pretty much screwed. So, I mean, this is a very simple case, right? All the zombies need to do is learn to patrol and chase. But we can see that evolution is working, and we are getting more intelligent zombies over time. So we're hopeful that this will then scale up to harder problems. We'll see. But here are some examples of behavior trees generated by this evolutionary process, uh, going from less fit to more fit. Um, these aren't like the perfect examples, these were just kind of selected just like from a large set of examples, kind of um, at semi-random. So the first tree, uh, you can see, probably didn't even do anything. Like it, it didn't move, it didn't attack anyone, it got a negative fitness score probably because of its size. The middle tree uh, at least seems to have a positive fitness score, and it seems to have kind of a more sensible set of nodes, um, so it probably moved around a bit. And the tree on the right, uh, it's a little bit hard to figure out exactly what it's doing because we don't have a very good way of visualizing these trees right now. Uh, we don't translate them back into something that looks tree-like yet. Uh, but you can see that it got a very high fitness score. It probably moved around and chased the player. Um, it's a little bit overly verbose. It has some extra things that don't need to be there. But we can hope that maybe in future generations, the penalty for larger trees would kind of whittle down the things that don't need to be there until we have a really nice usable tree. Or maybe a designer could look at this and pick out the parts that are really good and throw away the rest. Cool. So that all sounds pretty good, but we do have a bunch of limitations to think about and a lot of ideas for future work based on those. So these zombies, as I mentioned, are very simple, which makes this an incomplete test. We could easily construct a good tree for this problem by hand. Right? There's nothing about these zombies that would require this complex evolution system to make them good. Uh, but it would be really great if we could test on a bigger, more complete game. So that's something we're going to look to do if we can figure out a good test game or make one. And as previously mentioned, we 
don't generate completely new nodes or parameters yet. We just use this set of predefined nodes from a library provided by the designer. So that means that the designer has to create all the node types and parameters they want by hand. Now they can then let the tree uh, get combined automatically. But this may still be a lot of work to create this library. So it might help to reduce the workload for the designer if we could generate some of the parameters or maybe all of them by hand. We also have to directly interact with the simulation right now and help the behavior trees evolve and find good behavior. So they need a player to chase right now, right? So that means that the simulation is much slower and more labor intensive than it would be if we could just run the game really fast uh, in the background without any player involvement and get something interesting. Finally, it can be very difficult to define a good fitness function. Even for our simple game, you saw that there were several parameters that we had to tweak. We had to figure out a good fitness function. This may be really difficult for designers, uh, so we need to think about that. So let's start with player imitation. So some researchers have explored imitation learning in which an AI tries to mimic what a particular person would do in each situation. We might be able to explore using something similar to provide an approximation of the player for our system. And then helping designers create good fitness functions, as I mentioned, is something important to explore. So when designing a fitness function, the, need, the designer needs to ask themselves what they value. And beyond that, they need to figure out how to measure whether the agent is meeting those values. So there's been a lot written about the difficulty, or some say impossibility, of computationally defining fun, for instance. So obviously we can't rely on designers to be able to do that. But fortunately, we don't need designers to be able to define fun computationally, because ultimately they'll select and modify the resulting behavior. So they can look at the behavior and say, do I think this is fun? But we do need to be able to guide the evolution towards something that's at least kind of interesting or different, and let the designer have some cool ideas that they can look at and say which of these is fun. So we still need to provide some good assistance for designers in designing a good fitness function. So that's an area that we need to look into. Um, so I'm running out of time. Um, there's a bunch of other things that we could talk about. Uh, but I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, we will have a little time for questions. Thank you. Which of the like big, bigger game, games are using this uh, in their development? Uh, so, <laughs> as far as I know, um, I don't know of any games that are using evolving behavior trees in development right now. Yep. Um, that's why we're doing this experiment. Right. Uh, many games use behavior trees to create their behavior. Um, there have been some really good talks at GDC and various other places um, that describe really detailed uses of behavior trees. I remember there was one by uh, the division um, recently that was really cool. Um, yes? I'm, I'm curious. I, how did the alien from Alien Isolation work? Because I know they said they had, it grew as the player played the game. I, I'm just curious if you have any idea. I don't think I've actually looked at that particular AI system in detail to answer your question. I believe I have noticed that there are some videos, I think by the AI and games, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I think they did a video on the AI for Alien. Uh, so you should definitely look at that. Um, yeah. 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 All right, thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out, either here or online. Thank you.